Question 81. According to the CFA Institute Code of Ethics, CFA Institute members and candidates must do all of the following except act with integrity and dignity, exercise independent judgment, and not knowingly violate the securities acts and laws. So let's pull in our six components of the code and ethics here. Um, so perusing through these, we'll see that we do have um, act with integrity right there at the top. So we can go ahead and rule out A. Um, and then we do also have, uh, for number three here, use reasonable care and exercise independent professional judgment when conducting investment analysis. So we can rule out B as well. This is a tough question because C sounds like um, something we should also be doing, not violating the securities law. Um, but that's going to fall under the uh, standards of professional conduct whereas the first two answers fall under the Code of Ethics. So we'll stick with C. Question 80. Which of the following is not a possible disciplinary sanction with respect to the CFA Institute's enforcement of the code and standards? So we've got A, private censure. Censure is a form of um, expressing disapproval in a formal statement, and this is one form of discipline the CFA might use, so we can cross that off. B, payment of a fine. CFA is never going to impose uh, monetary fines, so that will uh, likely be our answer. Let's make sure we can rule out C. Suspension of a candidate from further participation in the program. Suspension from the program or revoking a charter are um, certainly ways that the CFA might discipline, depending on the severity of the actions. So we will go with B, uh, payment of a fine. Question 83. Tim Peters, CFA, is a senior investment manager at Staples Asset Managers. He will be leaving the company at the end of the month to join Gray Capital as a chief investment officer, where among his major responsibilities will be to increase the funds under management. During his last day at Staples Asset Managers, Tim contacts two of the clients he brought to Staples and informs them of the services he would offer them if they moved their accounts to Gray Capital. So under this CFA code and standards, Tim Peters most likely. So we've got violated and then two did not violate. So that's the first thing we need to kind of understand here. So the uh, we have during his last day. So while he's still at Staples Asset Managers, he contacts two of the clients he brought to Staples. Um, so he still uh, has a duty to Staples Asset Managers. Even though it's his last day, he has duty to his employer and he's not allowed to solicit um, current clients that he wants to bring to the new firm. So this is always going to be a big no-no um, and meaning that he violated the standards. And generally a lot of firms, especially if he's a senior person at the firm, um, they'll have some type of non-solicit agreement with the asset manager that they're at. So when you leave to go to a different company, you might not be able to even contact or solicit those clients for some period of time um, after you leave the firm. So we'll stick with A there, uh, violated the standard. Question 84. Mark Roberts works as a portfolio analyst at First Community Trust. He is charged with managing the account of one Sarah Sanders, a client. Miss Sanders pays First Community Trust a fee based on the performance of assets in her portfolio. Mr. Roberts' employer pays him a salary for managing Miss Sanders' account. Sarah Sanders offers Mr. Roberts an all expenses paid trip to Las Vegas, including free accommodation and use of her yacht provided that she earns at least 20% yearly pre-tax profit from her portfolio. What should Mr. Roberts do concerning the offer? A. Immediately inform his employer of the, f of the arrangement before accepting it. This sounds like um, a good option for us. Uh, we're always going to need approval from our employer for outside compensation per the standards. B. Uh, accept the offer, but only after assessing the likelihood of the proposed level of performance. This doesn't involve um, getting approval from the employer, so it's probably not going to be our answer. Um, 
C, wait until the yearly results are out before accepting the offer and then inform the employer of the arrangement of the arrangement only if the results meet Ms. Sanders' present condition. We need approval from our employer before uh, agreeing to any arrangement. So this is also not going to be ethical and it's kind of cherry picking um, compensation if results do work out. Uh, so we will go with A then, immediately inform his employer of the arrangement. Question 85. Zhang Yi CFA is an analyst at Power Stocks Incorporated. <coughs> Power Stocks plans to announce a change in recommendation from a hold to a sell on YYZ stock. Yi happens to be a member of the team that decided to change the recommendation. Yi's father has an account at Power Stocks, so he's a client, that's key here, um, that contains YYZ stock. According to the code and standards, trading on Yi father, Yi's father's account should most likely begin. A, as soon as the information is disseminated to all clients. B, only after the rec recommendation is announced to the general public. Or C, only after Yi, as a beneficial owner, has given an appropriate amount of time for his clients and him, his employers to act. Um, so even though Yi is, could technically be a beneficial owner in this case, since it's a uh, direct or close family member, all clients are to be treated equally, treated equally. So Yi's father is a client, um, since he has an account at Power Stocks, so he should be treated um, just like all the other clients are. Um, so we can go ahead and cross off C, um, has given the appropriate amount of time for his clients and his employer to act. He should be acting as his other clients are acting um, since he's a client. And then B, only after the recommendation is made to the general public. That's also not going to be correct. So we can go with A, as soon as the information is disseminated to all clients. Emphasis, again, because his father is a client. Question 86. Which of the following is most likely correct regarding standard 1B, independence and objectivity? A. Members and candidates should solicit gifts from their clients only after attaining great portfolio returns. Uh, this is a case where we really just need to use common sense. It's never, we should never be soliciting gifts from our clients. They're paying us money. Um, to do a service, we're never going to be soliciting gifts from them, so we can go ahead and rule that out. B, members and candidates should use favorable, should issue favorable reports, even if forged, um, on top of top companies upon request. Never going to be good um, to forge reports. That's going to be unethical and go against the code and standards. Let's make sure we can choose C. Members and candidates should not accept gifts, benefits, compensations, or considerations from their clients or prospective clients. Um, that's going to be a, a good answer and will be best practice by not doing that. You're uh, especially not accepting large gifts. It's going to be the best way to stay um, independent and objective in our analysis. Answer C. Question 87. A financial analyst who's a CFA member sends his, a research report on a company to his supervisor. The supervisor approves the report, but the analyst soon discovers that the supervisor plans to release a version of the report that shows stronger earnings estimates than the original report uh, without a reasonable and adequate reason. In response to this, the analyst should most likely A, let the supervisor do as he pleases. Um, this is... This is tough. This is going to be the most non-confrontational or political approach, if you will, um, because it's going to be tough for an analyst to kind of call out their supervisor and not necessarily call them out, but um, dissent or disagree. Um, but it pretty clearly states that there's no reasonable and adequate reason that the supervisor um, showed the stronger earnings estimates. So as a, as a CFA member, it's our duty to um, not ideally not let that happen. B, take up the issue with uh, regulatory authorities. This is probably going to be a little too dramatic of a first step. Um, they might not even have, the regulatory authorities might not even have jurisdiction anyway since this it doesn't mention anything about um, client involvement. So this might, sh might just be sell side reports. Um, so C, insists that the supervisor changes the earnings forecast or remove their name 
from the report. This sounds like the best first action. Going to the regulatory authorities is going to be too dramatic of a first step. If the supervisor won't change it, the report, then the uh, best thing to do is take their name off. So we'll go with C. Question 88. Jonathan Ingram, CFA, is a research analyst following Mountain Corp. All the information he has gathered suggests Mountain stock should be rated weak hold. During a recent dinner with a friend, Ingram overheard another experienced analyst saying the stock should be rated buy. He returns to his office the next day and issues a buy recommendation. Uh, Ingram, so we've got has not violated, has violated, and has violated. So we've got to make that decision first. Um, so the key here is all the information he has um, says that the stock should be rated weak hold. And then based solely on this other information from the something he overheard the analyst say, it should be rated buy. So he's changing it to buy. So this is likely a violation um, of um, adequate and reasonable basis for our recommendation. So we can go ahead and rule out has not violated. So then let's look deeper at what these questions say or what the answers say for reason for violating. So has violated. Um, CFA Institute Standards of Professional Conduct because he used material non-public information. There's nothing here stating that the analyst has um, material non-public information. This could just simply be his opinion that he thinks it's rated as a buy based on his analysis. Um, so we can go ahead and rule that out as well. Uh, has violated CFA Institute Standards of Professional Conduct because he did not have a reasonable and adequate basis for making his recommendation. This is going to be true. Going back to what we said earlier, all his information says we hold. Another analyst says buy, so he changes to buy, but doesn't really have anything other else to back it up other than um, that other analyst. So this is not a uh, reasonable basis for the recommendation. We'll go with C. Question 89. If a supervisor makes a reasonable effort to detect violations by their subordinates, but fails to detect a violation that occurs, he... A, is in compliance with standard uh, 4C responsibilities of supervisors. This sounds like it could be our answer. The key word here is reasonable effort. Humans are obviously not perfect and will always make mistakes, but um, we should make reasonable effort to detect violations that delegates make. So A is probably going to be our answer. Let's make sure we can rule out B, is always in violation of standard 4C responsibilities of supervisors. Um, We'll rule out since we made reasonable effort again. And C is only in violation of that same standard. If the violation occurs, it's punishable by, punishable by law. Um, whether it's law or the code and standards, we're always going to be following the more strict um, rule. So this is, uh, whether it's punishable by law or not, is not relevant. Um, so we'll go with uh, answer A. Question 90. Joshua Miller, CFA, is a portfolio manager responsible for the accounts of private wealth clients. Kim Ortega, one of Miller's clients, has a below average risk appetite. This is probably going to be important. I'll underline that. Her investment account is currently solely allocated to fixed income securities, hence the uh, below average risk appetite. After extensive research, Miller allocates emerging market equities to Ortega's investment account. He believes that the low correlation between domestic bonds and emerging market stocks will significantly reduce portfolio risk. In addition, based on numerous emerging market specialist reports, the emerging market stocks have significant return potential. With respect to the requirements and recommendations of the CFA Institute Code of Standards or CFA Institute Standards of Professional Conduct, Miller's decision to allocate emerging market stocks to Ortega's investment account is A is not suitable. Going from only bonds to adding uh, emerging market stocks does seem like a very significant jump in the risk profile on these specific assets. However, um, they mention that it will significantly, sorry, let me switch to a highlighter here. They mentioned it's going to significantly reduce portfolio risk. Um, so in the context of the whole portfolio for a uh, below average risk appetite, reducing portfolio risk is, is going to be a good thing. 
Um, so we can cross off is not suitable. B is in compliance. Uh, based on all the reasons we just mentioned there, um, in addition to, uh, where's that statement here? Uh, ex after extensive research. So there's a lot of thought and analysis going into this um, in making this decision based on reducing portfolio risk that we likely are in compliance. Let's just make sure we can rule out C, lacks a diligent and reasonable basis. Um, what we just highlighted there after extensive research kind of refutes that idea. Um, so we can uh, go with answer B. We are in compliance.